All right. Stephen Ultral is one of the original authors of the BLAST sequence similarity search algorithm. It is a senior investigator in the computational biology branch of NCBI, where he has worked since 1989. His research interests include sequence alignment algorithms, the statistics of sequence comparison, and measures of sequence similarity. Without further ado, Stephen Ultral. Well, thank you for coming today. This will be the first of two talks on the statistics of uh, local sequence alignment. The second one will be a week from today. Uh, these uh, two webinars will be somewhat different than others uh, that have come from the NCBI in that they will be much more theoretical and much less a discussion of how one uses uh, specific uh, programs. So, in comparing sequences, I tend to think of there being three uh, main questions that uh, tend to arise uh, in most situations. The first is a question of uh, definition. What is it that one is trying to find or to optimize? Uh, this arises in pairwise sequence comparison and multiple sequence alignment and phylogenetic reconstruction, etc. Once one has settled on a particular definition, uh, one then is faced with essentially an algorithmic or computer science <coughs> problem, which is how do I find or optimize uh, the proposed object uh, quickly or, or in reasonable time. And usually there then arises uh, a statistical question, which is, can the results that I've gotten be explained uh, completely by chance, or um, are they likely to have some biological meaning? Now, there tends to be a uh, tension between these questions in that one can sometimes come up with uh, very simple definitions that lead to rapid algorithms and tractable statistics but which throw out most of the biological content and are, may not be as useful. On the other hand, one can throw in virtually everything one knows about biology into the definition, and this leads to uh, very many difficulties in designing uh, good algorithms. And so there's a certain amount of art in finding a, a good trade-off here. Now, <clears throat> For pairwise sequence comparison, it was uh, the the earliest uh, algorithms and definitions uh, had to do with global alignments, and these this was back in the early 70s when there were very few sequences available, and those that were essentially all protein sequences, when they were related, tended to be related from one end to the other, and uh, one people recognize that there was a could be made a one-to-one -one correspondence between alignments and paths through a path graph such as this that began up here in the upper left you were one sequence down here another sequence across the bottom and you took a path always going to the right down or diagonally from one end to the other and this corresponded to a unique alignment with um, insertions and deletions along the way. Um, diagonal edge like this would uh, align uh, the letter uh, to the left, in this case X2, with the letter below it, in this case uh, Y1. Now, um, people started finding sequences that were not related from one end to the other, but contained just local regions of similarity. And for a while, uh, there were various definitions of local alignment that were put forward. Uh, the one that, that ended up uh, sticking was one that uh, was proposed by Smith and Waterman, which basically, this was in 1981, and this basically said that you took a path graph like this and you could begin anywhere in the path graph and en end anywhere to the lower right of where you began, and uh, you simply tried to optimize the score. There were basically scores 
assigned to each uh, diagonal step, which corresponded to aligning two letters, and scores aligned, uh, assigned to uh, vertical or horizontal steps. Now, um, it is these local alignments that are basically those that are sought by uh, popular uh, uh, database search programs such as FASTA and BLAST, and it's these local alignments, these statistics I'm going to be talking about today. Um, to simplify matters even further, um, I will for a while speak only about the statistics of alignments without gaps. And so that one, one is um, only dealing with um, diagonal segments in a path graph like this, which align equal length uh, segments uh, from the two sequences involved. Now, when one is, um, wants to ask what can occur by chance, uh, we need to have a model of chance. And so we are going to deal with a very simple model of what a random uh, protein is. I'm going to speak uh, mainly about proteins, although most of what I say can be uh, applied to DNA sequences as well. So our model of chance is that the 20 amino acids have 20 uh, probabilities of occurring by chance and that a protein sequence is a random string of letters. Uh, the letters are chosen completely independently. Now this, of course, is a very simplified model of proteins and we'll talk about some of the probability, pro some of the difficulties of applying this model to real proteins uh, towards the end of the talk today. We also need a scoring system, and we're going to try to maximize the scores of our alignment. So we need a score for aligning each possible pair of amino acids, and this basically comes in the form of a 20 by 20 matrix, which I will uh, call S sub 11 through S sub 2020. Now, our question is going to be how large... Uh, an alignment score can we expect from uh, two random sequences. Now, uh, for a scoring system, this is an example of a scoring system that is used uh, by default in uh, the uh, protein BLAST programs. This uh, particular scoring system was proposed in 1992 by the Hennikoffs. And next week, I will talk about where uh, a scoring system like this comes from. Now I said this is a 20 by 20 matrix. Here I'm showing only half of the matrix because in general these scoring systems are symmetric. Uh, there's no particular reason to give a different score for aligning alanine with valine than aligning valine with alanine, although that's not always the case, but um, in general uh, there's no particular reason to have different scores for those two. So one can simplify uh, the presentation of a square matrix by showing just this um, triangular matrix. Now what I'm going to be talking about today basically applies to any scoring system that you want to give me uh, with a few uh, constraints that I am going to impose on the scores. So the first constraint that I'm going to impose on the scores for local pairwise alignments is that I want the scoring system to have a negative expected score. In other words, if I simply take all possible scores and multiply them by the uh, probabilities of those scores occurring and add them up, I want the expected score to be negative. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. The first is that uh, none of the math that I'm going to talk about uh, would work without this uh, requirement, but there's also a very good reason that one wants to have negative expected scores when one is using them for local pairwise alignment and trying to simply maximize the score. And the reason is 
Um, this is a schematic of the alignment of two sequences. And imagine this little red uh, segment is the uh, local alignment that represents some true biology, uh, some true relationship that we're trying to find. Now, if the expected score for two random letters were positive, then simply by extending this alignment in both directions, um, one would tend to increase the score. And in fact, a very long alignment, uh, like this one, that doesn't have anything uh, that, that's completely random, but doesn't have any biological meaning, might very well have a higher score. And so when one is trying to find local alignments uh, with scoring systems, one wants to have a negative expected score. Um, one other um, requirement of the scores I'm going to impose is that at least one of the scores uh, needs to be uh, positive. Uh, if we're, again, trying to maximize the scores, if all the scores were zero or negative, the highest scoring alignment would be one that aligned nothing with nothing, had a score of zero, and that would not be very interesting. So we're going to make these two assumptions about the scores. From now on out, uh, both today and next week, when I say any scoring system, uh, it will be assumed uh, that the scores have negative expected score and that there's at least one positive score. Now, given these two constraints on the scores, it's a simple matter to prove, and in fact, I will do this in the next slide, that any substitution matrix can be written in this particular form. Now, what I mean by this form is that any scores, there exists a set of positive numbers which I call target frequencies. These are these Q sub i, j. So there's one of these target frequencies corresponding to each pair of amino acids. There's a set of positive numbers that add up to one, and another positive number, lambda, so that you can always write the scores uniquely in this way. So that given the scores, I can find target frequencies, and I can find lambda. If you remember your logarithms, uh, dividing the logarithms by a positive number simply changes the base of the logarithm. So here I'm talking about log to the base e, the natural logarithm, but uh, dividing by lambda just changes the base of the logarithm. Now lambda we, uh, is, uh, we call the scale parameter, and the target frequencies uh, are these Q sub i, j's. And basically, this week, I'm going to really focus on lambda. I won't have much to say about the target frequencies, but they will be the focus of my uh, talk uh, next week. Now, about lambda, if you give me a scoring system and say, this is the scoring system that I want to use, and I say, well, let's say, let me take all the scores and say multiply all the scores by 10 um, and use those scores instead. If you think about it, you'll realize that the score of all alignments get multiplied by 10, and therefore whatever was the best alignment is still the best alignment. If one alignment, if alignment A is better than alignment B, then when I multiply all the scores by 10, alignment A is still better than alignment B. And so, in a certain sense, multiplying the scores by a positive constant does nothing to the essence of the scoring system. And in fact, what, ha what one finds is that if I do this, the only thing that changes here is lambda. If I multiply all the scores by 10, lambda is basically divided by 10 and the target frequencies remain the same. It's really the target frequencies that define the essence of the scoring system, and lambda really simply provides a unit of measurement, a scale. If lambda is 1, so that the we're dealing with natural logarithms, 
we sometimes say the scores are expressed in NATS, that's N-A-T, for, short for natural logarithm. If instead lambda is the natural log of 2, that changes the scale to log base 2, and we then say the scores are expressed in bits, and you'll see why that is. And so the nice thing is that by allowing me to scale the scores, I can choose a lambda however I want. I can choose the logarithm any way I want. And if you give me a scoring system, I can convert it into a, a scores that are expressed in bits. Now, I said I'd prove this quickly, and I will um, go through this proof very quickly. You can look at it more carefully um, uh, if you want once the, these slides are available. Or I think they are available now. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to define a function f of x to be the sum of pi pj e to the s of ij x. So this is just a function of x. Here is a graph. Here is x, and here is f of x. And one will see that if you plug in 0, uh, because e to the 0 is 1, um, I have the sum of pi pj, which is just 1. Um, also, the first derivative of this function is this, and uh, it's already at zero, the first derivative is this, which by assumption, this was what we assume negative expected score is negative. In other words, the slope of this function is negative uh, here at zero. The second derivative you'll find is this which is always positive. All of these numbers, pi, pj, the score, score squared, e, they're all positive. And so this function is concave up. And in addition, because at least one of these scores is positive, that means that one of these things at least gets very large as x grows. And that means that this function goes up. All of these things together mean that there is a unique positive solution to f of x equals 1. So if I set this equal to 1, there is a unique positive solution, and that positive solution is lambda. It's very easy to write a program that will find lambda. If you want to do it, take any scoring system with negative expected scores, know the probabilities, and you can write a program that in a small fraction of a second will find lambda. If we simply define the q sub i's this way, then uh, it's clear that all, the, all of these q sub i's are positive. Again, all these are positive numbers. And they sum to 1 because the sum of these is simply, by definition, uh, f of lambda, which is uh, the solution that we said uh, was 1. So these are positive numbers that sum to 1, and if you just take these and solve for Sij, you get this. So it's easy to do this. You don't need to know all that, but if you want to uh, know the details of this, that is where lambda comes from and how you can actually construct the target frequencies in lambda from any scoring system. Now, when I say what can occur by chance, um, what I'm going, the way I'm going to phrase this question is I'm going to say, if I compare two random sequences of length m and n, so one sequence has m residues, the other has n residues, uh, the long sequence you could think of as simply a database of where by just concatenating one sequence after another, you can get the length of the database in residues. Uh, I will occasionally talk about the search space size as being the product of the lengths of these two sequences, which is the area of this uh, rectangle. So my question is, given a particular scoring system, how many distinct local alignments uh, with score greater than or equal to some number s, can I expect to find purely by chance from comparing these two random sequences? The answer is will be e, the, the expected number of, of alignments with score 
greater than or equal to s, and it will depend on the length of the sequences. It will, of course, depend on the scoring system as well. Now, I said distinct local alignments, and what I mean by this is that one could imagine uh, we're saying how many alignments are there with score greater than or equal to 100. Well, here I might have one alignment with score, say, 107 that I'm showing here that has score greater than or equal to 100. The next pair of letters uh, to the lower right perhaps ha might have score negative 3. And the pair of letters before this might have score negative 2. Now, if I extended this alignment by 1 in this direction, I'd still have an alignment with score greater than 100. If I extended it one in this direction, I'd have alignment with score greater than 100. And in fact, if I extended it in both directions, I'd still have an alignment with score greater than 100. So one might say, well, there are four <clears throat> alignments that have score greater than 100. By distinct, I, I rule this out. This is one al alignment, and I simply mean uh, by distinct that I'm talking about two alignments that do not intersect, and one can make this a little bit more mathematically rigorous. Now, first question is, how should this number, the expected number of alignments uh, that, let's say, have score greater than 100, we pick some score, how should that depend on the lengths of the sequences that are being compared? Well, if you uh, think about it, these alignments uh, tend to pop up uh, sort of at random in the, this alignment space. And so one can imagine, this is not a proof, it's simply to give you a sense of why this is the case, that if one doubles the size of the search space, on average, one should get about twice as many high scoring alignment. So each of the diagonal segments here represents, say, an alignment that has score greater than 100 given some scoring system. So in other words, the expected score should be proportional uh, to the lengths of the sequences. Now, um, I'm speaking here asymptotically. That means when the lengths of the sequences are quite large, and I'll have something to say about when the sequences are of smaller size um, at the end of today's uh, talk. <clears throat> now, the other thing that um, the expected number is going to depend on, besides the lengths of the sequences I'm comparing, is on the score. So if I increase the score and I say how many random alignments have score not greater than 100 but greater than 200, I'm going to expect many fewer, and the question is, how should this expected number depend on S? Well, I want to make an argument for plausibility that the number should decrease exponentially with the score S. Uh, to understand why this is the case, uh, let's uh, just consider a set of coin flips. Now, in fact, one could even come up with a scoring system like this. You can imagine comparing two sequences with just two letters, 0 or 1, and the scoring system could be plus 1 for match and negative infinity for any mismatch. In other words, the only thing we want is runs of matches. Okay, Now, if you begin at a specific place in the path graph and you say, what is the probability that a run that starts here has greater than or equal to h heads, it's easy to see that it is one-half to the h, that you have at least one head, you need to get a head the first time. To get two heads, at least two heads, you need to get two heads at the start, etc. And one-half to the h can be written in this form, e to the minus natural log 2 of h. So it's, it decreases exponentially with h. Now we're dealing not with, uh, now one could imagine extending this easily to see that if the probability of a match is p, 
you could have a 20 letter alphabet and they can have whatever probabilities you want and you can calculate what the probability of a match is, you can see that the chance that there are greater than or equal to H matches is simply P to the H and again it takes this form. You're decreasing exponentially with H. Now in general we're not dealing with match runs, we're dealing with scores and that is more complicated but one can see that if you want to get a score of 200 in a certain sense you have to get a score of 100 twice in a row, one right after the other and so if one is rare as a very small probability to get two in a row it's that probability squared and you can understand why this should decrease exponentially. Again this is no proof, it's simply to understand where this comes from. So in other words the expected number should decrease as e to the minus some constant, some constant times the score, the number that we expect to have score greater than or equal to s should decrease like this. The beautiful thing is that this constant uh, turns out to be lambda. Okay? So that is where lambda enters the picture. Now combining these two things, we have that the expected number, both of these were proportionalities, to make it equal we need a constant and I'm going to call that constant k. We end up with this fairly simple formula for the expected number of alignments with score greater than or equal to s. It's some positive constant k times m and n uh, times e to the minus lambda s. Now proving this is actually a very difficult proposition. Um, it was, uh, this formula was first um, described in this paper uh, with Sam Carlin from 1990. The proof of this awaited publication for four years in this uh, paper of, that Carlin wrote with Dembo and Zaituni. And uh, although the proof is very complicated, I wouldn't recommend you try to read this paper unless you are a graduate student in, uh, in statistics or probability, but the understanding the result is extremely simple. It, it makes beautiful sense where this comes from and we'll even see that you can even think of this in a simpler way. A somewhat different way of asking how many high scoring alignments can I find by chance is to say what is the probability of finding at least one alignment with score at least s? This is, is called not the e value, but the p value. It says, what's the chance that I find at least one alignment at, with a score this high? Now it turns out that the number of alignments, of high scoring alignments one finds, is Poisson distributed. You, you can read up on your, the prob probability of Poisson distributions which arise whenever you have a lot of very uh, rare events and you ask how many of them occur. Um, they tend to be Poisson distributed and uh, from that one can say that the probability of seeing no alignments, if I'm expecting to see E, the probability that I see none at all is e to the minus e, that comes from the Poisson dis distribution, and so the probability that I see at least one is one minus the probability that I see none, and that is this. So this is how you get a p-value from an e-value. In general, uh, in the BLAST world, it, we usually just speak of E values, but you can uh, get a P value from it. And when E is quite small, uh, then the E values and P values are essentially the same. If I expect to see only uh, one one hundredth of an alignment, what that tends to mean is that I almost never do I, I see one only usually 
one one hundredth of the time, and I virtually never see two. And so uh, that's why the p values and e values tend to be the same when e is quite small. Now, to simplify this even further, um, to, to basically use this formula, one needs to know k and lambda. I should say something about k. I told you how to calculate lambda. There is a way to calculate k, but the formula is much more complicated. Uh, if you want, you can find it in this paper, but one can calculate it. It's not hard to do. Where does it come from? Well, one way to think about this um, is I can just uh, go back, let's see, go back a few slides, is that if this is a high scoring alignment, if the previous pair of letters has a negative score, then there's no way that a high scoring alignment can start here because um, I can always improve it by starting after the negative score. And so what one can imagine is that not all possible places in the search space are places that a high scoring alignment can plausibly start. And if you want, you may can think of this as simply saying that this is, there's only a fraction of the places where uh, high scoring alignments can, can really start. Now, to simplify things a little bit further, um, if I take the raw score S and I convert it into what I'm going to call a normalized score by first multiplying by lambda, subtracting by log K, and dividing by the natural log of 2. You can work this out on, with a pencil and paper from the previous formula. What you find is that now I've basically folded these statistical parameters into the score, into the raw score, to get a normalized score. And the expected value now takes this extremely simple form. It says the number I expect to find by chance is simply the search space size divided by 2 to the bit score. So you can do this almost in your, your head. If I'm comparing a protein of length 250 residues to a database of a billion residues, and I want to know how many alignments with normalized score at least 35 bits I can find by chance, well, the search space size, 250, it's best to do this in powers of 2, is roughly speaking 2 to the 8th. Uh, 2 to the 10th is about 1,000, so a billion is 2 to the 30th. So the search space size here, n, is roughly 2 to the 38th. Um, the bits, uh, normalized bit score is 35, so the number I can expect purely by chance is essentially 2 to the 3rd, or 8. If I increase the score to 45 bits, that decreases the expected number by 2 to the 10, or a factor of 1,000, and the number I can expect by chance decreases by a factor of 1,000. So that the statistics, this formula for how many alignments can I expect by chance can hardly be simpler. Now, I want to say a few more things before I deal with any uh, questions that might have arisen. There is a sidelight from these, um, uh, these statistics which is called the extreme value distribution. And the extreme value distribution arises by instead of um, asking how many alignments are greater than a given score S, which um, decreases exponentially, um, or asking what is the probability of getting at least one alignment with a given score S, if instead one simply does an experiment many times and plots the highest score, and, and, says, and, and says, how frequently do I get different scores? Then the highest score I get tends to follow an extreme value distribution. Now, extreme value distributions are uh, 
let me relate them to normal distributions, which most people are familiar with. Uh, normal distributions arise um, all the time because they, they come from the case where you have lots and lots of, of observations, lots and lots of events, and you add them up. You add up, say, the scores from all the events. So you can imagine that one's height might be uh, adult height, might be the effect of a large number of different genes that have small effects. So you add up all of these small effects, and given certain assumptions, um, what you find is that no matter w w what the small effects are, when you add them all up, they tend to give you a normal distribution, a Gaussian, which many people are familiar with. The Gaussian has two parameters. One says what is the um, mean value, and the other says what is the spread or the, the standard deviation. Now, the extreme value distribution is very similar, except that instead of adding up all of the scores, we're taking the highest score from a large number of identically distributed uh, distributions. Now, there actually are different types of extreme value distributions, but the one we're dealing with takes this form. It has, again, two parameters. One tells you what the mode of the distribution is, and the other is the uh, decay. This is the standard extreme value distribution where the mode is at zero, and this uh, decay goes as e to the minus x as you go out here. In general, like the normal distribution, a general extreme value distribution will have a different mode and a uh, different spread. But given those two parameters, one can find the extreme value distribution. Now, the interesting thing is that everything I have said so far was, has had to do with alignments that don't have any gaps. Now, if we instead allow gaps, we have scores and we allow gaps, then so long as the gap scores are not too um, close to zero, so that they, they don't cost you too much, so long as the gap scores are negative enough, then basically everything I've said about the statistics still applies to the scores of gap alignments. Now, so far, there is actually no proof of this. Uh, this is, has not been proved mathematically, but there, uh, most people believe this is the case. And in fact, there are many computational experiments you can do, and it looks as if it is the case. The main difference, once you allow gaps, is we no longer have a statistical theory that allow us to calculate lambda and k. We can calculate lambda and k when there are no gaps. When there are gaps, we don't know how to calculate these two statistical parameters. However, we can estimate them. And one way of estimating them is by using an extreme value distribution like this. In this particular case, I have taken a particular scoring system. I think I simply used the Blossom 62 scores I showed you before. I used affine gap scores that gives you a score of minus 11 minus k for a gap of length k. And I compared 10,000 pairs of random sequences using a certain background uh, distribution for the amino acids. And I've plotted the number of times I see different scores. So the scores are all integral here, and I have a histogram of how many times I've seen different scores. And then I have simply found the maximum likelihood fit of an extreme value distribution to these data. And from that maximum likelihood fit, I can calculate I can estimate lambda and k, I can approximate them for a GAT scoring system. Now this takes a fair amount of time, unlike 
um, the analytic theory where I can calculate in a fraction of a second what lambda and k is. Here I have to do a rather complicated experiment. More recently, some colleagues of mine have improved on the way that one can calculate these parameters described here, and one can now get quite accurate estimates of lambda and k uh, very rapidly um, in the order of seconds rather than, uh, than minutes. Now, how well do these statistics apply to real proteins? So far, we have talked about proteins. We have this model of chance where the amino acids are kind of drawn out of a hat. But real proteins uh, don't, uh, aren't constructed that way, and there may be all sorts of correlations uh, between uh, the amino acids you see at one position and those you see at other positions. So how well do these statistics apply? Well, it turns out that they re apply remarkably well to uh, globular proteins, to proteins that sort of fold, fold up some, something, say, like um, hemoglobin, where it's all rather compact. There are certain proteins, however, um, where these statistics don't apply very well. And so the first sort of situation where the statistical theory I've applied doesn't really work very well are so-called low-complexity regions of proteins. Now, if you look at many proteins, you will find certain regions that have repeated, certain letters get repeated over and over or are, are much enriched. So here we have a lot of P prolines. If you look at this pro, pro, protein here from the database, a lot of serines and a lot of threonines and a lot of prolines, and here a big run of, of Qs. I guess that's uh, glut uh, glutamine, I guess, is what the Q Qs are. In any case, um, these proteins clearly don't follow this random uh, model that we have assumed, and the statistics tend, uh, tend to break down. Now, to deal with uh, these regions, um, there are various uh, things one can do. One is that one can try to recognize these particular regions, these so-called low-complexity regions, and mask them out by, say, replacing them all by Xs and giving them a negative score. That is uh, one approach to which is called low-complexity filtering. This was used by BLAST for a while and may still be used in certain contexts. You can turn this filtering on or off for either the query sequence or the database sequence. Um, there are, are other ways to try to deal with these um, non-standard regions, which um, I call composition-based statistics or substitution matrix adjustment and are described in these papers. Uh, th this is really beyond uh, the scope of, of this particular talk. One should say that these low-complexity regions, the whole idea of an alignment in a certain sense is not quite a coherent concept to apply to these because these repeated sequences probably arose by slippage um, in replication where certain residues or certain stretches of DNA were getting repeated over and over again. And so the whole idea of a one-to-one -one correspondence between one sequence and another doesn't really apply. The other place where this uh, these statistics break down are that the theory I've described is an asymptotic theory. In other words, it applies to sequences that are uh, sufficiently long. Now, if the expected length of an alignment gets as large, so if the score is high and the expected length of an alignment with that score gets to be about the length of either of the sequences you're comparing, then these asymptotics um, sort of break down and the statistics don't apply very well.
one can deal with this, uh, what I have sometimes called the edge effect, basically says that an alignment that starts near the edge of the path graph can't possibly get a high enough score to exceed S because you run out of space. Um, these edge effects, uh, we can correct for them. I described how to do so in this paper. And uh, more recently, again, some colleagues have much improved on the theory of how you correct for edge effects. And these uh, corrections are built into uh, the, the BLAST programs, and so uh, they are dealt with there. Well, that is all that I have to say uh, today about the statistics of local sequence alignment. Uh, just as a preview for next week, I'm going to be talking about what I think is actually more interesting, and that is where do these scoring systems come from, and what are the target frequencies all about. That's really where biology enters uh, the picture. Uh, if you look carefully at what I've said today, there really has been no biology in it. It's all been what can you expect to find by chance when you have certain scores and have random sequences, and there's really, um, in a certain sense, no biological content in, in today's talk, but that won't really be the case uh, a week from now. So at this point, um, if there are some questions that have arisen, I will try to answer them. Stephen, the only thing that we got initially, well, let me see what we're getting now. So we got a couple of um, assertions, really, about alignment-free algorithms. And if you wanted to comment on those, that might be interesting. Right. Uh, so alignment-free sequence comparison algorithms, I think, in general, are basically take a sequence and construct a vector of the frequency that certain uh, tuples occur in the sequence and then compare it with a vector that is constructed from another sequence so that in fact uh, the, the these comparisons really have nothing to do with the length of the sequences and simply have to do with comparing these two vectors and can can take place very quickly. The problem sounds to be simple enough that there are, I would expect there would be uh, good statistics for it. I'm afraid I'm not prepared to comment on the statistics of that sort of sequence comparison. So I'll answer the other questions in text a little bit later. I think there's there's one question, one more question that we uh, we might want to deal with, which is, are there some metrics uh, for when one should use low complexity filtering? Uh, yes, I I think uh, again, I would probably refer you to this uh, paper by um, Wooten, who uh, really first developed this, and. I, I think the, the metrics for when one wants to use the low complexity filtering are mainly um, empirical. One thing that he did find is that he could set parameters in different ways that he could even use the low complexity filtering to predict uh, where certain globular regions of proteins were going to be. So the low complexity regions are frequently more extended uh, regions of the protein and break domains. And uh, by setting the parameters one way, you could actually predict where the uh, low complexity regions are. We hope in general to do as little filtering as possible. And by using some of the other uh, ways of, of dealing with the statistics of these regions, we uh, we try not to uh, filter for low complexity regions unless unless we really need to. Uh, but the the details of this are they're all empirical. I mean, we basically try different things and and have have different criteria for when we apply different fixes to deal with these uh, non-standard uh, compositions. Fantastic. So I think we're going to leave it there. There's a couple other. Uh, questions that we'll probably uh, address by text.
And uh, with that, uh, we'll thank Stephen, and we will go ahead and um, uh, resume this next week. Thank you to those who sent us notes saying you were looking forward to next week.